Welcome everyone to Superhuman Entrepreneur. I'm back with you once again, Dr. Matt Accurso, and it is amazing to be back with you, like always. It is a beautiful, sunshiny day here in Florida. I got a couple waves this morning. I got a matcha tea on the beach, and now I get to sit with a person that is just doing ridiculously amazing things on the planet. And you know, the cool part about this individual is that not only does he teach it, but he lives it. I can't wait to introduce you to Dr. Chris Cook, but I want to tell you a few things about him first. Dr. Chris Cook was a former counterintelligence agent. He is the founder of the Center of Compassion, Creativity, and Innovation. He's a professor of political science at Western State University, and he's the author of the book, The Compassionate Achiever. When I saw one of his videos and read some of the things that he was putting out there, I was blown away at how he was showing up with this amazing element of compassion in all that he does. And so we're going to talk more about that today. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Chris Cook. Dr. Chris Cook, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, man. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me on. It's an honor. Yeah, man. I I appreciate you just coming on. And then not only that, but just what you're adding to the world and what you're teaching uh, on so many levels is so important for all of us to understand. And that one word, compassion, you know, I think we've lost the essence of what that looks like to operate within compassion in our everyday lives. And I, I mean, I know I forget it. I know that a lot of individuals that are listening out there, we forget it. And so I think it's really cool what you're doing. And, and I want to start off by, you know, talking with you, You've, you have a long list of things that you've been involved with. And all of that has led you to author this book, The Compassionate Achiever. Tell us, you know, what, what brought you to this point? I think you kind of <laughs> summed it up. It's a lot of different activities, a lot of different professions that I've, that I've done. Everything from working on Wall Street to being a counterintelligence agent for the U.S. Army to you know, playing high school football and sports. I'm a true believer that academics and athletics go hand in hand. And when I was taught a lot of these in a lot of these different places, everywhere from the battlefield to Wall Street to the gridiron to the to the baseball diamond, I had coaches and I had mentors who constantly said that I had to be more ruthless. That I had to I had to uh, you know look at the world in a zero sum way. So that if one person's gain uh, one person gains something, another person has to lose something. And I listened to that. And, and, but then when I observed actually who rose to the top for a sustained amount of time, it was actually the people who looked out after others. Hmm. It was the people who had compassion for other people. And I'm not saying that jerks, that selfish people don't get to the top. They sometimes do. But I noticed that they burn out faster hmm. than anybody else. Because there are people that they took down when they went to the top that are chomping at the bit when they get the chance, when there's one slight little opening to take them down, the people who, you know, were selfishly regarding themselves as they moved up, they get taken down much faster. And, you know, you see it in business world, right? You had Enron was considered the model of being a corporate leader and and, and attaining money and Mm -hmm moving up, it, people wrote about them as examples. And Enron, we know, you know, looked out for their own bottom line and literally drove electricity into the ground to make it scarce so it could raise its own profits. And where are they now? They're gone. Yeah. They're no longer in existence. But then you have businesses like Patagonia who are constantly giving back to the communities that they're in and, and to the natural parks. And they've been around since the 1970s. Hmm. And you, you see it, you know, not just in businesses, but even in history. You see it in, um, you know, Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union, was once asked by Churchill, you know, uh, you know, aren't you fearful of the Pope? And Stalin laughingly, you know, responded back to Churchill saying, how many divisions does the Pope have? Well, mm. where is Stalin's Soviet Union? That's right. It's in the dustbin of history. And where's the Pope? He's still around. It's mm. not about force. It's never have been about force. It's about coordination. It's about cooperation. It's about collaboration. And even Darwin has said that. And if you look throughout the history of humankind, it hasn't been one person against the elements. It's been a group of people that are moving forward together. And I think we've, when we lose compassion, 
we lose the essence of who we are as human beings. What made human beings able to conquer the world? Compassion is nothing about being soft. It's about succeeding. And even when you think about compassion as soft, I ask that you simply <laughs> look at the real world around you and look what cuts through hard elements like rock. It's a hard element, but what can cut through rock? Water, mm. a soft yeah. element. So from history to business to natural environment, you know, what we think is soft and won't help us succeed is actually the opposite. And, and I think we've unlearned some key aspects of, of what it means to achieve success. And, uh, you know, you're, you're catching a wave this morning. I'm actually going to have to shovel snow <laughs> where, where I'm at. And, you know, when you catch a wave, I love surfing. It, mm. it, you're one with nature. Yeah. And, and that flow, there's, it, there's a natural high that you get out of it, right? Those endorphins, man, are kicking in. Mm -hmm. And when you're tubing it and you're riding it, there's nothing like it. And that's when you're going with the flow, when you're, when you're not fighting against something, when you're making it part of who you are. And that's what compassion is. Yeah. Wow. You know, where do you think it comes from that we get this mentality that we, you know, have to get ours and kind of ignore the rest. You know, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who's famous for the social contract, he actually said this. He, he says literally that we are all born, quote unquote, with natural compassion, unquote, and that we unlearn it through society. And, you know, it's, it starts from the very beginning. We, you know, when I was teaching overseas on a Fulbright scholarship in the country of Estonia, and I was teaching 119 different European students from all over Europe. And I was explaining this theory called realism that's about basically about zero sum in international politics. And I was saying, you know, when you're on the playground, right, you play king of the hill. And there's this one young Polish scholar. I'll never forget her. She said, Dr. Cook, what's king of the hill? So I had to explain hmm. on American playgrounds that we play a game where other kids push other kids down. Mm -hmm. so they can stay on top. Right. And then we have this other game called kill the carrier as well. Right. Where you throw yeah. the ball and then you gotta <laughs> run for your life. Uh, yeah. And I was done finished with it. And she goes, okay. And, and she, and she raised her hand again and she goes, thank you very much. And I was feeling so good. I was like, all right, I explained, you know, the idea, you know, that she could understand it. And then she finished, she goes, thank you very much. That explains so much about the United States. Wow. Cause they don't play wow. King of the Hill there. They don't play kill right. the carrier there. Right. It's our society that we're so individualistic. We, we've become hyper-individualistic that we're actually, paradoxically, taking ourselves down, right? Yeah. That, think about when the U.S. economy was humming on all engines. It was after World War II when we were coming together, when we were addressing issues, when we created the interstate system, the highway system. We looked after each other. We, we started the GI Bill in College Fund, which actually helped me get through college. We've forgotten what made this country strong and this mm. great. And I think when we look through history, when you look at the Roman Empire, any of the empires that preceded great, our great power, they all fell from within. It wasn't an enemy on the outside that took the great powers down. It was mm. their own demise. And I, I think that we can stem our demise by looking out for each other once again. Wow. What do you think about when I've thought this way in my life before as well, when you think, well, if I show compassion, that's showing weakness. And if I do that, then someone's going to take advantage of me. And so almost like that person that's been, that's gotten burned, you know, seven, eight, you know, 10, 20 times. And you're like, okay, I'm done showing compassion. You know, it's like, if I, if I do that, then I'm opening myself up for more pain. What would you speak to a situation like that? Boy, there's so many different ways. There's, a, yeah. there's two different ways that you can go out. One, I think you're misunderstanding compassion. Compassion, uh, let's just define it right here. It's got two parts. It's a 360 degree holistic understanding of a problem or suffering of another. That's the first part. And the second part is that you take action to address that problem. So it's about solving problems. It's about not creating new problems. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so that's first and foremost. I think that, you know, compassion is about 
addressing issues and problems and trying to create ways that are constructive in terms of finding paths out of those problems without creating new ones, without creating new waves of, of problems. The other is that, yeah, you do get burned every so often. You know how civil society and, and great powers work? They actually build trust. Yeah. And with trust, you will get burned every so often. But I would argue that that trust actually leads to greater success over the long haul. Mm. Right? You're going to have you know, short-term losses. And you're going to have short-term failures. And I would argue that we learn more out of failures than anything else. Innovation, creativity comes out of failures. It doesn't come out of success. Yeah. And I think we've lost that. We, we've become a society where you, you think you always have to win. And I think that that mentality actually creates weakness because it doesn't build resilience, that's for sure. Resilience mm-hmm. comes out of falling down and picking yourself back up, right? It's, yeah. it's the idea of the first Rocky <laughs> shows when I was growing up as a kid. Rocky Balboa, right? Getting knocked down on the mat, picking himself back up, right? It's Michael Jordan yeah. making his high school team, right? It, we've become a society where you think you always have to win. And when you think you always have to win, first off, that's a fixed mindset. You're going down. A growth mindset is that means you can learn from anything. Yeah. Nelson Mandela had the great, one of the greatest quotes. He says, I never lose. I either win or I learn. Mm. Right? I and, love that. Yes. And so compassion, compassion, sometimes it's not going to work. And you might get burned. But that person and those people, you never know who's watching you. And I've had more doors open for me because I did something nice for someone, not because I, I thought anybody was looking. I didn't think anybody was looking, but yeah. someone was, and they found out, and then I got burned, and then a new door opened, mm. right? If you're doing it because you think that somebody's going to do something for you, you don't understand compassion. Compassion, a byproduct of it is success. It's not the reason you do it, but it's a byproduct of it. It's an intrinsic motivation, and any study and psychology and political economy shows you that intrinsic values lead to success and happiness more than extrinsic values like money or position. And compassion by in and of itself is an intrinsic value. And by any studies of intrinsic versus extrinsic values, intrinsic values trump extrinsic values all the time for success. Interesting. Wow. Love what you just said. So, was there a moment in your life, Chris, where you saw compassion or you had to give compassion or something kind of like the, the magic mirror for you? Like, did you just all of a sudden walk through this and say, okay, I need to begin delving into this topic and teaching on this topic? Was there some, some situation in your life that you saw that really moved you to want to step further into this realm? I, I think, you know, professionally there was, but I had a lot of great role models growing up my grandfather and my, both my grandmothers. And I saw what they were able to do by helping other people. And it, I didn't know it at the time when I was a kid, but their examples rubbed off on me unknowingly. And then mm. I had a chance to invite the Dalai Lama to our campus and I, I got wow. to have breakfast. Oh, man. Wow. <laughs> well, we got to talk about that. I mean, obviously, we got to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> and to sit down, and, and he stayed for two days. You know, that was wow. the crazy part. He gave two, two talks on um, two different days, and that, that was special by itself. And when it's about a five year process in order to get his holiness, it took us a five year process, wow. I should say, wow. um, to, to, get, to get him there. So I started you know, diving into a whole bunch of different types of aspects of compassion and, and, and Buddhism. And, and, and when I first started getting prepared to, to get him here, I realized it was kind of this Jenga piece for in my entire life, from military to <laughs> um, Wall Street to sports to academics, that compassion is the one thread that was the most, co- it was the common denominator. And by preparing for His Holiness to come, that's when it kind of all clicked for me. It all kind of became this beautiful jigsaw puzzle of a bunch of different pieces 
became a giant picture that I was able to frame after I was gluing it all together with compassion. So I've had a lot of great people. I've been fortunate to have, you know, both my grandmothers and, uh, and then getting the, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, to come to campus. I think that was the, the piece that put it all together for me. Wow. Let's talk about that. I mean, here, here you are with, you know, uh, a human being that's considered quite possibly the most compassionate <laughs> human that's ever <laughs> lived. Um, you're, you're sitting down with the Dalai Lama to breakfast. I mean, a lot of people dream about these moments. They only read about these moments. You got to experience it. You know, what are some things that you can share with us that um, our listeners can take away from that moment that you had with this amazing individual? The tranquility and peace that he brings to every place he enters, the sincerity, the trustworthiness. He's not worried about getting burned. <laughs> Never, right? It's about being open to those experiences. And I remember the university photographer came into the room as he gave me a kata, a silk, white silk scarf and blessed it and put it over me. And I am geeked out. If you see that picture, I think it's up on the net. <laughs> I am okay. I'm totally geeked out. You can see my eye, my eyeballs are, are popping out. I am, I am, I'm in another world. And, and Peggy is her name, the photographer. She goes, Chris, what were you feeling there? That, that expression is so wild. I said, I felt like I was everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Wow. I felt like when I first went to see my uncle's name up on the Vietnam Memorial and I scratched his name on a piece of paper when I was, uh, when I was in the military myself. So the first time I was able to go to D.C., the first thing I did was go to the Vietnam Memorial to, to get my uncle's name. And he was a Green Beret in the U.S. Army and died in Vietnam. And when you're at the Vietnam Memorial, at least when I was there, it's an outside memorial, but I felt like I was inside. And I couldn't hear anything when I was scratching his name. And it's just the love I had for him and, and the sacrifice that he gave for our country. It made me feel like I was surrounded by love and, and, and power. And that's the way, similarly, but in a different way, that's similarly the way I felt with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. When he grabbed my hands, I felt like I went around the universe, but then I was also nowhere in the universe. And it's, it was this weird paradox. I felt like I could do anything and conquer anything as long as I kept an open heart. And that that sincerity that he has is so genuine and so real that you can't help <laughs> but have that same that same feeling yeah. so you know when someone tells me they're worried you know they got burned they're still looking out for themselves and they're still they haven't matured yet they mm -hmm. haven't they haven't grown into a person they're still selfishly absorbed and when you're not worried about getting burned, you help so many people, which also helps yourself as a byproduct. It's so true. It's so true. Because I, I think back on my own life and how when I let go of my own agenda, which I'm telling you, it's easy to talk about on a podcast, <laughs> everybody out there. Like I'm not like an expert at this. It's hard. It's, it's very hard because we build our lives on dreams, right? We build our lives on, you know, our aspirations and our goals. And especially in this day and age, it's like, you know, there's this mentality of just once again, just, you know, kind of get yours and go for your goals, your dreams. And there was something that I heard, I'm going to totally butcher this, but something that I heard about if all your prayers were to be answered today, would they help anybody else or would they just help you? I look right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Garth Brooks had a song about this back in the 90s. I love all types of music. And, yeah, you know, country, me country. too. <laughs> and he, he had a song that said, thank God for unanswered prayers. Mm. And for me, that it, it's, you miss life by thinking that there's only one wave to ride. And yep. I, you know, you're, you're out there catching waves and, and, it's, it's, and it's like running sometimes. Right? Sometimes you don't feel like I'm a long distance runner. And it's the days that you don't feel like you can actually go out and do a mile where all of a sudden you're doing 11 miles, the fastest pace you've ever, ever done. After the first mile you're in, 
you're like, oh, wow, this is a great day. Mm. But if you looked at it from the very beginning, it looked like it was going to be an awful day. And the same thing when you're surfing, I would argue. Sometimes it just it doesn't, you know, you don't want to, it doesn't look right. Mm -hmm. And then you, you just give it a little chance and you're just like, you know what, let's just go out there. I just love being out there. Those are the days that are usually the best. It's true. Very yeah. true. Right? And it's the same thing we're running. And I think if we stay so focused on what we think our dreams are and not are open, not open to letting life help us create dreams so that we can ride the wave. I, I think you miss so many cool rides in life by trying to control it, by trying to steer it one way. I, I think you, you miss, I would have missed the love of my life if I did that actually. Wow. Um, my, my wife, she, we're going to be married 30 years. This wow. Day. Congratulations. Thanks. That's and, huge. <laughs> and you, I look was, like, uh, you look so young. It looks like <laughs> thanks, you're <the> 10. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. And I remember the, the young lady before my wife, we met in senior year in high school. I was on the lifeguard stand. I was actually on lifeguard duty when the young lady broke up with me. And I was like, all my buddies were like, they came down like, you know, Chris, you want to get off the chair? And you want to? I said, no, no, I'm good. I'm like, how can you be good? You just got broken up with. I said, that means something better is going to come along. Wow. And sure enough, my wife was there. Wow. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> the, the best thing in my life came along. And, and I think that when you get down, when something happens, and I, I think we, we fail to look at the possibilities that maybe a new door is opening up. Maybe some new opportunities is happening. And we forget that because we become so self-absorbed. We stay down. And, you know, it was the one thing when this young lady broke up with me, I was like, you know what? That means something better going to come along. I, I've done the best I can. And, you know, I just wasn't good enough for her. And, man, then everything came right. Everything wow. locked in. And my wife's been with me from counterintelligence days to se semi-pro baseball to my Ph.D., to everything. And I consider myself a very lucky man to have met the love of my life so young. Hey, superhuman. Thanks for letting me interrupt this amazing show. Did you know that your mattress doubles in weight after 10 years from all the dead skin, dust mites, feces particles, and dust that's accumulated inside of it? Gross, I know, and you're probably eating, I apologize. The fact is, most people have no idea that their mattress is an oversized, fluffy Petri dish that can cause all sorts of issues like headaches, achy joints, sinus congestion, decreased libido, and severe low energy. I've been researching the perfect high-performance mattress for over five years now, one that I can truly stand behind, and frankly, I haven't been able to find it until now. It's called Samina Sleep Systems. That's S-A-M-I-N-A -A, Sleep Systems. This is hands down the most advanced bedding system on the market. And talk about comfortable. I could lay on just the bare organic mattress and be out in seconds. But don't listen to me. Try it for yourself. They have a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not sleeping 10 times better in 10 days, call me and I'll give you a special gift just for your efforts. You can go to Samina.com. That's S A M I N A.com. It is a German company, so you're going to want to hit that little translate button at the top of your browser and it will translate it to whatever language you desire. Hey, I really look forward to seeing you next time on the show. Thanks for spending time with us. This is kind of like a side note, but I feel like this is worthy to ask. What have you found is the secret to? Your secret. I know everybody has their own secrets. What's your What's your guys' secret to having this long lasting love of your life? Boy, there's a bunch of them. One yeah. is trusting each other. Just utmost trust. If you can't trust, you can't love. It's something else. If you can't trust, mm -hmm. that's one. The other thing is that you're there for each other. It's an unconditional love. It's you know, I had a dog growing up. And he was always there. His name was Bullet. My dad was a New York City cop. So I, I was five years old when I got him. So I called mm. him Bullet. Um, <laughs> he, um, he was there for me and everything. And I, I never forgot that. And same with my grandmother. And I told myself that I would love somebody unconditionally, whatever. And I, I take those words to heart when you take those vows. And mm. if you can't do that, don't ruin somebody else. Mm. Right. And, and so it's, to me, it comes down to pure trust 
And if you can't trust, if you're worried about getting burned, you're not going to have a marriage. Yeah. Right. And so you've got to be ready. You, you've got to be set in your own self. You've got to be able to trust yourself. And I know a lot of people who can't. They say they do, but they don't have compassion for themselves. And I don't know if you can build trust in yourself unless you have compassion for yourself. Wow. Do you feel like that's the first thing that needs to come? Compassion for yourself before so. giving compassion to others? I think so. Because, yeah. you know, one of the things I used to write on my mantra in, in high school was, you know, I've got to strive for perfection. I wrote that down. And I came into a few teachers <laughs> who pointed out how imperfect I was. <laughs> <laughs> and I needed that because I was striving to be on top of everything. And so I changed it. I changed the mantra to strive for excellence. Because hmm. you can be excellent, but nobody can be perfect. Nature's not even perfect. When you, you know, I, I did landscaping jobs for a while. And when you, you did perfectly boxed out square lawns, it looked weird. But when you put <laughs> curved, right? Curved and yeah. swerves in just like nature. And I mean, you, I'm getting, I'm talking to a nature man. You, you're, you're on the curve. Absolutely, curve, man. Right? Absolutely. You're on the curve. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and same thing in, in, in you know, the, the, the earth, not just the water, but it's never perfectly square. It's mm. always got these round edges. And so a lot of the things that I did in, in, in life, even as a side job, landscaping is to put curves in places. And my clients would love it. They're like, oh, it makes such a big difference. And yeah. all I did was just copy nature. That's yeah. basically, that's what I did. And, and it, it's not perfect. And I think that when we think we have to have the perfect marriage, that's when you start getting screwed up. Once again, it's a paradox. It's like compassion. You think it's weakness, right? Not you. But some people yeah, think yeah, it's weakness. Right, right. Actually, strength. Gandhi said, right, only the strong can forgive. And he's right. Mm -hmm. I think only the strong can be compassionate. Weak people, people who fly off the handle and get angry, easy road rage, for example, mm. they are weak because, yeah. man, they, they let their emotions just guide them from step to step. There's no, there's no strength. There's no resilience. There's no grit to doing that, that's the easiest thing to do is to get mad. Yep. But if you can see how life can, has these twists and turns and these beautiful curveballs that get thrown at you, instead of freaking out, relax with the swing, man. Yep. And then watch the ball go over the fence. Yep. I think we forgot about relaxing, about meditating, right? about enjoying life. So true, I have a friend who raps for a, a living. I mean, he lives, he lives the life and we were on the phone one day and he said, Hey Matt, you know, heal people, heal people, hurt people, hurt people. Mm, so true. And you know, it rocked my world. Cause it, it is so, like you're saying, you know, strong people, those are the ones that, you know, that, that show compassion. You know, it's, yeah. it's when, when, when you don't, when you're, when you're residing in yourself and your selfish ambitions and all that, that's, that's weakness manifesting itself. I hundred percent agree with that. And it's such a, such a high level conversation right now, Chris, I'm loving where this is going. So along the lines of self-compassion, what do you think are some things, if someone wants to work on being more compassionate, what are some things that a person can do today to try and become more like you or the Dalai Lama or let's stay with the Dalai Lama. <laughs> okay. Let's stay with the Dalai Lama. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a four-step process that I outline in the book, and it's called LUCA, L-U-C-A. And for me, the very, very first step is to listen. Listen to understand, not listen to reply, right? So practicing, practicing listening is a skill that's a lost art. And I do it by listening to podcasts, basically, to not just the ones that I like, like yours, but to ones I disagree with and have to listen all the way through yeah, without stopping, without screaming at it, without, <laughs> right, to learn. Cause there's always a kernel of truth in every, what everyone says. Right. And there's going to be some people who disagree with me. And I love that. I love debate as long as it's constructive debate, right? as long as we listen to each other's perspective and points of view, but we don't do that anymore. We listen to take down other points of view, not to construct new ways of moving forward. And I think that 
what we've forgotten is that everyone has a, a point of view. There's, there's a, a book I just finished recently called The Knowledge Illusion, which highlights how, that what neuroscientists have always said, that we don't see with our eyes, we see with our brains. And neuroscientists have proven this. But when you see with your brain, your emotions, your experiences color and frame what you actually see. So everyone sees the world differently. And I think that's a good thing because that's where innovation and creativity can pop out of. And I think that we've forgotten that the simple act of listening gathers more information and more perspectives and more ideas than anything else. And I wish we could go back to listening to each other rather than screaming at each other. Wow. I feel like we could end our conversation right there. <laughs> it's, so, <laughs> it's so monumental though. It really is because... Well, Listening to know or listening to understand is the first yeah. and then, um, understanding to know what you need to do to help somebody and then connect with capabilities is the C and then A is act to solve. So Luca, listen, understand, connect and act. Wow. And do you teach this in your classes? I, well, what's funny is when I, um, I'm one of those professors who actually doesn't assign my own books because <laughs> I, I think that it, that becomes indoctrination in my college classes and mm. I'm about education. Yeah. So what's funny is that some students will, will find my book and read it and then bring that in into class. And I'll actually try to take it down my own work because I want them to see that no one has all the answers, but the answers are found in listening to each other. Actually answers are found in better questions, to be honest with you. Mm. All right. I think if we ask better questions, yeah. we'll, we'll have a better guide of how to, how to achieve what we want to achieve in life in, in, a, in a much more constructive way. And so I do teach this though in businesses and outside as a consultant. I do talk about it in talks that I give out in the public or, you know, a commencement speech that I'm, I'm planning to give in May. So yeah. I, I do it there, but, and I do it in book clubs, but in the classroom, I'm very wary of indoctrinating. I, I don't think indoctrination is education. So I stay away from it in the classroom and to, to the chagrin of some of my students, they want to talk about it. And so what I'll do is in upper level class, I'll set it up where they have to give presentations of their own. I give them my presentation where then they can take questions and try to take it down, right? Mm -hmm. to, to try to deconstruct it. And what's really fun is I start off so that they can come at me because I, I grade their writing. I grade their, you know, their thinking and, and their logic. And, and I said, you know, the presentation that I give on my work, that's where you guys get to deconstruct me. And, we, and hopefully we can learn from each other. And you wow. can make either my arguments better. And to be honest with you, Matt, that's where I found, I think, some of the strongest parts of my argument is when I was first talking about the importance of compassion and success, my critics initially would always bring up Charles Darwin. And Charles Darwin, you know, was sup supposedly it's survival of the... Fittest, right. And that's not Darwin. Right. Darwin never said that. Yeah, yeah. This guy right. named Spencer, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so, yeah, right. You're right? right. Once I listened to my critics and then I read Darwin, I realized Darwin supports compassion mm. as a part of the evolutionary process. Uh, he, he talked a lot about sympathy, didn't he? Yes, he did. Yeah. And the yeah. descent of man and sympathy, yeah. right? It, he, he used sympathy in three different ways, compassion, empathetic, or, you know, generosity even. So it all depends on where you're, you're talking about uh, Darwin and sympathy, but yes. Yeah. And, but that's not the Darwin we're taught. And this right. is where it comes exactly. back to your initial question of why, you know, and I use the King of the Hill example of why we don't get compassion, why we're so self-absorbed. But it goes back not just to what we do, but what we teach each other. And we've taught each other the bumper sticker version of Darwin that's absolutely wrong, right? If you pick up Darwin and you can get his books for free. Mm. <laughs> They're everywhere. Just read Darwin. Don't read an interpretation of Darwin. Read Darwin himself. And you'll see that he's all about compassion, all about sympathy. I love that. Love, the, love those points because you're, you're right on. Because a lot of, I mean, most often, you know, people do regard him and with the survival of the fittest. And that's, not it at all. <laughs> so I, right. I love I love where the conversation's going. And that's um, where I listen to my critics, though. Yeah. Right? If I didn't yeah. listen to my critics, I wouldn't have found that. 
Right. Very cool. So kind of, you know, coming to a culmination here, I want to, I want to kind of do a rapid fire round with you. Is that okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So first, you know, I want to ask you, uh, t- you know, talking about compassion and it would seem obvious that what you're passionate about, but your answer may look different. So I want to ask you this question. What are you, what are you passionate about as an entrepreneur that our heroes listening can benefit from? Um, I'm passionate about solving problems. I love getting into the weeds of things. I love them backing out like a drone uh, and, and seeing the high, the high end. I love complexity science where you take mm-hmm. different d- disciplines, different perspectives, and you smash them together in a blender and come up with new ways of addressing everyday issues. So for example, right now, the last few years, I've been working on social emotional learning in schools. And I've worked with one of the moms of the Sandy Hook wow. tragedy. And you know, she came looking for me because she knew I was working on social neuroscience and putting together a social emotional learning program. And so to help minimize the number of school shootings and, and to reduce them. And I said, it's, it's not a quick fix. And for someone who was in the military, it's not arming teachers. That's for sure. It's, there's no quick fix to this. This is about social emotional learning, about creating environments in school that kids feel that though it's a, a safe place. It's a place that you can go to no matter what your background is. And, and social emotional learning creates those environments. It, it creates that environment. Matter of fact, David Brooks, in New York Times recently wrote an op-ed uh, about what gets schools going. And he talks about leadership and the role of leadership in creating an environment where everyone feels as though they're safe to learn and succeed. And mm. that's social emotional learning. And yeah. it's called SEL. And so you only get to those things, I think, by looking at different perspectives and from, from different disciplines in life. And so what gets me passionate and going and this is why I'm the director of the honors program. The honors program slams together all these different disciplines, economics, biology, business, nursing, you mm. name it. And, and so when you sit down with all these students and you talk about issues that are happening in everyday life and the different perspectives that come out of it, holy cow, mm. you, you feel rejuvenated. You're like, okay, we may have one problem, but you know what? We have about 10 different ways of addressing it. Wow. That's right. Cool. Let's go for it. Let's see. Yeah. Right, some of them are not going to work, but boy, when you have those, you know, it's like a Swiss Army knife for life, and that's passion. That's what gets me going. That's why I'm in education because I think ignorance is our greatest threat. And with understanding, not just knowledge, because knowledge you can just fill in little bubbles on a test sheet, and that doesn't get you any wiser. But understanding is when you take knowledge and you put them together like Lego pieces to create new perspectives and a new way to see the world, that, that, <laughs> man, that gets me pumped up. <laughs> and your, your energy is coming through the line right now. I'm loving it. We all need a Dr. Chris Cook, by the way, when we're addressing a problem. So he can present <laughs> to us 10 solutions. Here, here are 10 solutions. Pick one. Um, what creates the most peace in your life, Chris? Oh, boy, I think it's a combination of things. When I come home, when I drive up my road and get to my driveway, I always take a deep breath, and I didn't even know that. When I come home, that's peace. Mm. And I wish everyone could feel that, and I know they don't. But I have three little boys and a wife and a dog that just make life (laughs) peaceful. And I know it sounds chaotic, but it's this chaotic peace that happens. But Personally, what I do is I run and meditate. So I'm a long distance runner. And when I'm on the road running, it's the, uh, I feel like I'm, I feel like everything is doable. And then when I come, I do a 10 minute compassion meditation as a warm down. When I'm stretching, I put my legs up on the wall and I have a 10 minute compassion meditation. And it's like a reset button. you're You're laying on your back and your feet are up on the wall? You got it, man. Okay. Yep. That's cool. And I have 10 minutes where I, cause I, it, the best thing to do is to get your legs never to cramp is mm-hmm. to put your legs up after your, after your run. Yeah. And so 10 minutes is it. And so I realized I was cheating without the compassion meditation and then I wasn't getting my compassion meditation. So I decided, you know what, I want to put them together and it's worked like a charm for me. And that, you know, my boys can come with me at, with any problem and I'm, I'm good to go. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that, man. 
What helps you enter flow state or get in the zone during your day? It's to get up and move. When I'm stuck, I have a, a path out on my back. I have three acres and I created what I call the pondering paths. And so, for example, if I have writer's block, all I have to do is step on the pondering path and all of a sudden ideas come. So I always carry a, a pad with me. So when I'm home, getting on the pondering paths at work is to literally go downstairs to where the students are at in the honors house and literally just to talk with them and to hear what they want to do and the people that they're becoming, that gets me pumped. Hmm. And they think I'm helping them, <laughs> but Matt, they're really helping me. <laughs> Chris, we need more teachers like you, man. I wish I, ha- I, I wish I had a professor like you. I, mean, I should say, I shouldn't say that I've had a couple, but you know, it's professors like you that allow individuals to truly be who they are and, and, and imagine and create and not be scared to go out there and make it happen. So thank you so much for showing up the way you do, Chris. And for everybody out there, I think you would agree that Dr. Cook's passion comes through the line. What books would you recommend right now if you could choose one or two to tell mm-hmm. listeners about? One, since we've talked about him <laughs> already um, before. Actually, can I give two? Absolutely. Uh, his, you can give, you can then, give four if you want. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Universe in a Single Atom by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. It takes what I consider complexity science and puts it together with compassion in a way that's so beautiful. It's like the one book I would take with me if I was on a deserted island because when, every time I read it, I learn something new. So it's one of those books. But then also the Book of Joy by him and Desmond Tutu, Archbishop Archbishop, uh, Desmond Tutu. They co-wrote a book called The Book of Joy, which I think is so much fun to read. And every chapter is is very different. And then for the business and the entrepreneur side, definitely Give and Take by Adam Grant. It's Give and Take, you know, it really helped me get me motivated to write my own book as well. And I'm, I'm writing these down, but for everybody out there, uh, these are going to be in the show notes, by the way. So anything that Dr. Cook goes over is going to be in the show notes, not to worry. If you could pick one action step for our listeners to take from this call, what would it be? Listen, listen to each right. other. Listen with your eyes, <laughs> with your brain. Listen and don't talk. Mm. Hold yourself back. Let people, let the awkward silence hang for a while. It's okay to have silence. And sometimes in that silence, you can read body language of people and what they're really trying to say. Sometimes people just say things to get through things, but their actions and the way they hold themselves sometimes speak louder than any words they say. So take the time to listen to someone, especially those that you you love. I'm going to let that just settle in with all of you listening. I think that's a great place to end. Dr. Cook, you came on this show and you not only delivered, you blew it out of the water. Thank you so much for coming on with us today. Thank you, man. Hopefully if I'm blowing it out of the water, you got your board and you're well, absolutely, away, absolutely. Right. Now you're talking my language. <laughs> and by the way, you are welcome to come anytime and I'll put you up on an eight foot longboard and we'll catch. Oh man, dear. I'll right. take you to some secret spots. And I'm dead serious about that. I've actually had guests come in you and uh, I've taken a couple of them surfing. So the offer is on the table, my friend. Um, <laughs> if people want to learn more about you and your work, and what you're doing, where can they go to learn more? So I'm on the net at Chris Cook, and I got that weird last name, K-U-K-K, so it's C-H-R-I-S-K-U-K-K.com, and you can see uh, a bunch of things that I'm, I'm doing there. And I run the Center for Compassion, Creativity, and Innovation at Western Connecticut State University, as well as the director of the honors program there. Uh, so you can jump on wcsu.edu and get me there. You can also, uh, we have a Compassionate Achiever podcast on iTunes. Uh, And so we interview various uh, Compassionate Achievers from different walks of life, everything from police chiefs who have woven compassion into their uh, practices to recently a mom who had lost her daughter to school violence. Uh, A young man stabbed her to death in the school hallways and she's Mm. created a foundation to help other, other people so that they can avoid having that happen to their daughters and and sons. So there's a bunch of different ways and uh, look forward to 
meeting you all out there. Wow, Dr. Chris Cook, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much once again for coming on. To everybody out there, you know, I just want to challenge you to, and myself, <laughs> to listen more, to stop what's going on in your day. Take five minutes, even if it's stepping out in nature and just listening to nature. Listen to the surrounding sounds around you and truly appreciate the breath that we get to take today. We get to wake up. We don't have to wake up. We get to wake up and live this amazing life. So to all you superhumans out there, continue to listen, continue to breathe, continue to be the amazing person that you are. And I'll see you next time. Hey, World Changer. I hope you enjoyed today's show. Do you desire to gain an unfair competitive advantage in life? Do you want more energy, focus, and clarity to add more life to your years and years to your life? I can almost hear your answer coming through my headphones, a resounding yes. If that's the case, you can go to superhumanentrepreneur.com forward slash hack in order to get your free high performance hack guide. That's www.superhumanentrepreneur.com forward slash hack. My mission is to help activate high performance among 10 million entrepreneurs and their families within the next 10 years. If you're loving the content you're hearing, you can partner with me on this mission by simply leaving a review on iTunes. If you do this now, I'd very much appreciate it. Thanks for listening, and I look forward to giving you even more high performance value next time.